Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss a challenging entity of entire orthopedic field which is congenital pseudoorthosis tibia. I am Dr. Bilal and you are watching FRCS Orthopedic and Trauma First Aid video. Let's proceed to our presentation. First we will discuss what are the types of bone deformity. There are three types of bone deformity, anterolateral, anteromedial and posteromedial. These are classified on the basis of apex of direction of the bowing. If apex of the bowing is directed anteriorly, it is called anterior bowing. If the apex of bowing is directed posteriorly, it is called posterior bowing. If the apex of the bowing is directed anteriorly as well as laterally, it is called anterolateral bowing, which is a feature of congenital pseudoorthosis tibia. Anteromedial bowing is a feature of fibular hemimelia, whereas majority of the posterior medial bowing are physiologic. What is pseudoorthosis? It is an abnormal union formed by fibrous tissue between parts of a bone that has fractured. What is the definition of congenital pseudoorthosis tibia? A congenital bowing of tibial diaphysis with the apex directed anterolaterally, which is associated with the pseudoorthosis. Pseudoorthosis or fracture may not necessarily be present at birth but develops postnatally due to fracture non union. Here is a clinical photograph of a right leg which shows the bowing of tibial diaphysis. The apex is directed in the anterior and lateral direction, which is a feature of congenital pseudoorthosis tibia. Apart from the bowing and pseudoorthosis of tibial diaphysis, there may be other features present, such as cortical thickening, narrowing of the medullary canal, or cyst. The disease is extremely rare, there is no sex predilection. 55% of the cases are associated with the neurofibromatosis type 1, whereas 10 to 50% of the cases have association with the fibrous dysplasia. The pathology is confined to a segment of tibia and not the whole length of the tibia is pathological. There is abnormal tissue which is called fibrous hematoma, which is composed of heavy cuff of abnormal highly cellular fibrovascular tissue. The bone, the periosteum and the surrounding tissues are also abnormal. Fibroblasts form the main population of cell in fibrous hematoma. So, fibrous hematoma is the pathological lesion which is present in congenital pseudoorthosis tibia because it decreases the bone production and affects bone healing. <coughs> Numerous classification system has been described in the literature which indicates the heterogeneity of this disease. There is Boyd's classification, Crawford classification, Anderson classification and a Boyle two-stage classification. First, we will discuss the Boyd's classification. In Boyd's, Boyd's classification are further divided into six types. In type 1, pseudoorthosis occurs with anterior bowing and the defect is present at birth. In Boyd's type 2 classification system, the pseudoorthosis occurs with anterior bowing. There is hourglass constriction of the tibia which is present at birth. In type 2, spontaneous fracture often occurs or after following trauma. Type 2 is also known as high risk tibia. It has association with the neurofibromatosis type 1. It is the most common type and it has a poorest prognosis. See, this is a plain radiograph which shows anterior lateral bowing and hourglass constriction of the tibial diaphysis. In Boyd's type 3, pseudoorthosis develops in congenital cysts at the junction of middle and lower one third. Anterior bowing may precede or follow a fracture. Recurrence is less common. In Boyd's type 4 classification, the pseudoorthosis originates in the sclerotic segment of the bone without narrowing of tibia. The prognosis is comparatively good. In Boyd's type 5, pseudoorthosis occurs with dysplastic fibula. Both tibia and fibula may be affected. Prognosis is good if the lesion is confined to the fibula. And in type 6, pseudoorthosis arises from intraosseous neurofibroma or schwannoma. Next comes the Crawford classification. Basically, it has four types, and each type represents a progression of stage. In type 1 Crawford classification, this is anterior bowing and increase in cortical density. Medullary canals are well preserved. 
in type 2 there is anterior bowing however there is narrowing of the mallory canal and cortical thickening is extensive in type 3 there is anterior bowing and there is a cystic lesion which is present in the diaphyseal region which is a sign of pre-fracture and in type 4 there is bowing with clear fracture or with feature of pseudoarthrosis. A poil 2 stage classification system are basically two types type 1 and type 2. In type 1 there is atrophic pseudoarthrosis and in type 2 there is extensive hypertrophic pseudoarthrosis. Regarding the clinical features as we have already discussed there is a bowing which is in, in the direction of anterior and lateral aspect. There may be association of shortening of the leg. Classic site of bowing is junction of middle and distal one third. It is usually unilateral and there be many, may be manifestation of neurofibromatosis type unlike cutaneous manifestation, catholic spots. X-rays are usually diagnostics and plain radiograph may show convex anterolateral bowing. There may be dis tibial or discontinuity. You have to observe the degree of displacement as well. You have to comment on the sclerosis uh, which involving the margins and you have to see if there is any cyst uh, hourglass appearance uh, in case of type 2 Boyd's classification and medullary cavity is whether it's partially or completely obstructed and you have to see whether fibula is involved or it's fine the aims of treatment is to achieve and maintain union to prevent refracture address limb length inequality and to prevent future complications like ankle deformity and arthritis. Non-operative treatment is done with the bracing in clamshell orthosis or patellar tendon being bearing orthosis and it is indicated in children of ambulatory age and it is also indicated in bowing without fracture or pseudoarthrosis. Spontaneous remodeling is not expected. The goal of uh, PTB orthosis is to prevent further bowing and fracture. Osteotomy for bowing alone is contraindicated and it is maintained until skeletal maturity. Surgery is, is indicated when there is pseudo orthosis or fracture. Now what are the goals of surgery? As we have already discussed the fibrous hematoma is the pathological lesion. So, you have to resect it. Resection of pseudoorthosis to grossly normal bone, correction of alignment, bone grafting and stabilization of the ringing segment, intramedullary splinting of bone is desired. There are three surgical options. Number one is intramedullary nailing with bone graft, vascularized fibular transfer and the third one is Elizarov technique. <coughs> First we will discuss intramedullary fixation. It was first described in 1956 by Sir Chanley and the principle is based on the resection of areas of pseudoorthosis with stable intramedullary fixation and transfer of a large bone graft. Intramedullary fixation has certain advantages over other, met other methods because it addresses the alignment, it addresses the deformity and it guides bone lengthening during growth usually telescopic nail uh, peter william nail or pins are placed in the medullary cavity you can see intramedullary nailing for congenital pseudoarthrosis tb has done there is growing rod or telescoping rod you can say The disadvantages of intermedial fixation is that there is frequent need to bridge the ankle and the hind foot resulting in pain and stiffness of the ankle. Release of the ankle after union of pseudo-orthosis only slightly restore the ankle motion. Pest cavus or valgus angle deformity can develop during growth and there may be leg length discrepancies. The other surgical option is vascularized fibular transfer which is first described in 1978 by Juje and Gilbert. The principle is based on wide dissection of dystrophic tibia that is you have to remove the fibrous hematoma and replacement of fibrous hematoma by healthy vascularized bone transfer of fibula. Hypertrophic the bone transfer is then observed in response to mechanical stimulation. Here is the pictorial presentation of 
vasculized fibular graft transfer a long segment of the opposite fibula along its vascular pedicle is harvested the transfer into the gap created after radical excision of pseudo orthosis segment the vessel of the transferred fibula are anastomosed to the local vessel the transferred fibula is fixed securely to the tibia usually with the screws or pins however there are certain disadvantages of vascularized fibular graft there is frequent necessity of second graft at the bone fibular junction recurrence of fracture is usually high because at the bone fibular junction or in the body of fibular graft before hypertrophy the fracture may show there may be residual angulation or particularly valgus and recurvatum deformity may be present valgus angle deformity on the side of harvested fibula on the donor side the other surgical option is elizarov technique the advantages of elizarov techniques are small bone fragments can be stabilized with this technique residual deformity can be gradually be restored leg length discrepancies can be addressed the external fixation can be extended to foot depending upon the anatomical form of pseudo orthosis and the technique of elizarov is that direct compression of the area of pseudo orthosis may be applied with or without resection of uh, fibrous hematoma if the resection of fibrous hematoma is done then diaphyseal transfer is performed after uh, epiphyseal distraction or proximal metaphyseal corticotomy small graft or intertibial fibular graft may be performed during the same procedure on a se- or in a second step to reinforce union here is the uh, congenital pseudo orthosis to be treated with the uh, elizarov and bone grafting was done and you can see there is a healing of uh, pseudo orthosis so there are certain re- recent advances in the congenital pseudo orthosis we must have heard about bone morphogenic protein it's type 2 and type 7 basically these are osteoinductive proteins and these are used in adjuncts to other t- surgical treatment the other one is induced membrane and spongy autologous graft which is also known as maskele technique the other one is periosteal grafts and pulsed electrostimulation <clears throat> so let's have few words about maskele technique basically uh, it is a two stage surgery in the first stage uh, induction of a pseudo synovial membrane is done by placing a cement spacer after resection of the fibrous hematoma the spacer fill the defect to be reconstructed associated with the stable internal fixation and in the second stage of surgery after the induction of pseudo synovial membrane the sen- cement spacer is removed and is replaced by spongy autologous bone graft the pseudo synovial membrane creates a true biological chamber because it is high in concentration in bmp2 and it is high in concentration with osteoinductive growth cells so the principle of maskele technique is that complete resection of diseased bone and fibrous tissue followed by stable intermedial fixation and placement of a cement spacer in first stage after the induction of pseudo synovial membrane the replacement of fibrous hematoma and the diseased periosteum by vascularized membrane producing vascular and osteoinductive cell growth factor associated with the stable fixation the other one is periosteal graft which was described by pale free periosteal grafts are harvested from the iliac wing because these periosteal grafts are rich source of osteoprogenitor cells which is present in the periosteum complete resection of the diseased periosteum around the edges of pseudo orthosis is done periosteal graft which cover the resected area after placement of a bone graft so amputation is an other surgical option for congenital pseudo orthosis tibia and below knee amputation is usually not indicated amputation through ankle that is boys or sim amputation is preferred and it is indicated in failure to achieve union after 3 or 4 surgical attempts 
when there is deformity of the foot is present and there is significant leg length discrepancy is present that is more than 5 cm then Symes or Boyd's amputation is done. There are two types of prognostic factor which affects the union of pseudoorthosis of tibia. The general factor is that uh, if pseudoorthosis of tibia is associated with the neurofibromatosis, it has a negative prognostic value. And age is a favorable if slow progression and lay fracture. That is the delayed presentation of pseudoorthosis has a good prognosis. The local factor which are important for union of pseudoorthosis that side of site of pseudoorthosis the more distal side the bad prognosis it is and the types of pseudoorthosis as we have discussed Boyd's type 2 congenital pseudoorthosis has a poorest prognosis compared to other types and if the fibula is in involved then it has a negative prognostic value the complications may involve stiffness of the ankle and hind foot there may be refracture there may be significant leg length discrepancy and valgus ankle deformity may develop thank you very much listeners i hope you have got true knowledge of congenital pseudoorthosis tibia for more videos please subscribe our channel